Well, hello, everyone. How are you doing? I don't know what day it is, so I'm just going to say, hi, my name is Luke Thomas. I am one half of your hosting duo on this lovely podcast. We call ourselves Morning Combat. Our gig here is we routinely accuse other shows of gimmick infringement <laughs> for no good reason. <laughs> my name turns is Luke out, Thomas. Tur turns out we might have been wrong, Luke. We may have been the infringers. I don't know. Anymore. Yes, I don't know. I don't know, but that's a different discussion for a different time. Here's what I do know. It's time for a mailbag episode. Hi, I'm Luke Thomas. That's Brian Campbell, the King of Connecticut. But what's up, BC? How are you doing? Yeah, so here's the deal. This is a normal slot, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern on the YouTubes for this great show, Morning Combat. But Luke and I are on vacation. It's August. and But yet, you know, our producer, Mikey Morms, is like, nah, brah. You got to still fill this hole. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, you know, if you're, you're going to come, come on, bro. So, you know, we're coming. They were here. We're here. All right. So here we are. This is, uh, we'll have a couple of these. This is about sports today, stuff, different stuff in MMA, but, uh, we're not going to do like crazy, you know, would you do a bong out of a dead body type questions? We're going to keep it mostly related to MMA and things like that. Uh, yeah, thank of you course, for scamming the system to get these right. questions to us. Thank you. We have we to get these questions. We ask you to scam the system by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and then we go from there. Uh, as always, like the channel, subscribe, uh, like the video. I should say anyway, subscribe to the channel, and um, yes, tons of great content. As I have to watch BC's stupid, stupid face. <laughs> yeah, well, why don't you, know, why don't you yeah. dye your hair jet black again, there, Wayne Newton? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, you want to get this started? Be sizzle. Um, yeah, watch all of our stuff. All right, maybe you know, I don't know. Well, I don't care. Whatever. Yes, get Showtime. Go to morningcombat.store. You know, get Showtime and get Ben. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, BC. Let's kick this off. We've got some questions from people who helped us scam the uh, rating system. There, we'll go to number one. This person has no name. They're 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 just a drifter. They come into town. They bang all the girls and then they leave. <laughs> You know, like like all 80s heroes. Um, who are your top five non-UFC champions? Is this a favorite? Who we think they're the best? What's the deal here? What's this? What, I mean, you got to simplify here. So I'll, I'll say, like, when I think about who my top five, I mean, if they're asking currently, it's harder to say. Um, if they're asking, like, historically, you have to go pride- uh with fedor as heavyweight champ you can probably, there's probably a few pride titles so who are go. the five best fighters in mma history who have never been a ufc champ is that really what this is saying no no no. who it could be well here's what i was going to say so fedor would have your heavyweight title right from pride i think you could even do aldo wec featherweight champion that was non-ufc at that time okay when he was okay. that you could probably, if you wanted to, you could add Dan Henderson if you wanted as like either, you know, a double champ in pride, the first real kind of double champ. Um, um, Michelle Waterson, female Adam weight. Is there. There's Rumble on the Rock belts. There's Icon Sport belts. There's rings. Who are some other ones? I've given you like two or three here. Um, was it the Alvarez Bodog champ at lightweight? <laughs> I mean, what are we doing here, bro? What are we even doing right now? I would say, wouldn't you add, um, you could add, who was like the best strike force champion? Jake Shields was champ for a time. Luke Rockhold was pretty, as you know, didn't have a lot of defenses, but was a great fighter and was strike force champion, right? Yes, he that's true. Jacques Ray was for a time. Technical classic. Yes, that's true. Um, and Dan obviously Hendo there's been the dream way. champions there. Oh, oh, you know what? You could say Alistair Overeem when he was Dream and Strike Force and K1 champ simultaneously. Pre USADA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was awesome. Uh, you could say yeah, whatever you want about it. It was not a bad time to be a fan. Um, that's probably. God, we didn't name any Bellator champs. <laughs> Jesus. Joe, Joe Soto. You know uh, what? what? I think you could add uh, uh, you could add Pitbull to the list. Maybe you if definitely you can add, add Pitbull. Give me, you know, give me featherweight pip. Oh, you wanted to do featherweight Aldo, but yeah. But you can do that too. Okay. Uh, but there you go. Th those are some answers to your questions there. All right. This is from Danan or Danan. Hi, guys. First off, you guys are my number one fave combat sports podcast. Yeah, goddamn right. And he goes, and I listen to them all. Well, you shouldn't do that. You, yeah, should just listen you to audio one. whore. Yeah, yes. right? Yeah. You absolute slut of audio. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> you guys are blah 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 not a bunch of nice things and whatever i'm not gonna read it uh okay 
Given the flash evolution of the quality of athletes that are now entering MMA, the speed in which new techniques are being developed and perfected, along with improvements in training, skill, tech, blah, 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 how will MMA adapt? Do you imagine a time when more moves are outlawed, where DNA tests become standard like PEDs? Will rules need to change to protect fighters? I'm not really sure exactly what he's asking. I mean, if the question was simply based on fighting style and strategy, I've been waiting, Luke, for the evolution of some type of new, not a new base, but a new way. I mean, I'm not talking about just calf kicks, how that may have altered the game in recent years. I mean, like, is there going to be a discipline? I mean, it was rare to see a karate star like Machida or Thompson. It was rare to see a top level judoka like a like a Ronda or whatever, or or uh, my guy uh, Caro Parisian. But I'm talking about Luke. Is there a fighting discipline that hasn't made its mark within the cage that will, or some sort of variation of one that could become a trend where people are like, "Holy crap! I got to start doing that," Luke. Like jiu-jitsu in the 90s american wrestling in the early aughts and uh what have you am i speaking out of my a-hole luke i don't i don't think so i think that's probably right but he's talking about a bunch of different stuff here's the question you got to ask yourself bc I, i'm not sure what the dna tests have to do with everything like there's one thing to be like oh it's the nfl where you know they'll run a series of offensive schemes and by the end of that season or at least the beginning of the next a lot of that shit doesn't work it's like how RG3, you know, partly had injury issues, but like part of it was also just schemes that the, the, the NFL just kind of adapted to. That's different than what's happened with the NBA, where the game is just is very much different than the game we grew up with. It's much more spaced out. Obviously, look at the scores. Defense is just not, not only is it not what it used to be, it can't be. Well, rule changes uh, facilitated the NBA's change because scoring was down in the late 90s and very early 2000s when the lockdown defense really took over right that started in a lot of ways well with the bad boys but really came to providence with the mid 90s pat riley Knicks, and eventually luke david stern didn't like the way this game was being presented it was thuggish it was defensive heavy so he opened the lane and he really created an avenue for guys first steve nash then all the way through steph curry to be smaller but can take over a game will there be a rule change akin to that in MMA mm. or rule changes, which would open the door for a fighter who in the past would have been considered marginal or average, but because of this rule change or adaption, think Steve Nash's MVP years, Luke. Before that, Steve Nash was an adequate, good, above average, but not all-star starting point guard, right? Then he became a back-to-back -back MVP because of the rule changes, although let's also give credit to Mike D'Antoni in the seven seconds or less offense that system that they ran will you see an equivalent like that to mma at all well i think um you kind of already are a little bit like to me it's not a coincidence that you have fighters like leon edwards and cyril gone existing at the same time right and again they do they they have their own ways of fighting they have their own ways of managing risk and rounds and positions and they go to things in their own proclivities in their own ways but what underlies them both is they fight at distance. They don't take a lot of damage. They're good at neutralizing their opponents. And there's not necessarily a little bit. This is different for Cyril Gone, but um, there's not necessarily a ton of, you know, action heavy fun associated with their game. That There's a reason for that is because while it's difficult to pull off what they can do. Uh, and to an extent, I would put Volkanovsky in that group as well. A little bit, a little bit. Um, it's a once you can master that, it's a very difficult person to beat. Very, very difficult. Or, you know, you take something really special, some kind of major specialization. And obviously a lot of people might have those, but they've moved away from hardcore Habib-like specialization. So I, I tend to wonder um, about that. I also tend to wonder two things. I would say, to what extent does knees to the head of a grounded opponent as or it strikes to the head of a grounded opponent? To what extent does that change? If that begins to open up, we just saw, I think it was in Colorado, they're going to allow different rule sets, pride and one style rules. Um, with the uh, fights being judged and whatnot. That's, to me, an interesting development. And the, I think the other one I would say is beyond just like knees and whatnot. What if judging changes? What if we went, oh. I, I mean, this seems to me highly unlikely, BC, but what if we went to like a pride-like system, judging a fight as a whole versus not? There you go. That's the potential like, what, change. The, what, where, what, does, what does that mean? Yeah. That means you're not fighting for rounds. You're fighting 
exclusively for damage in big moments. And you could say, well, you're always fighting for damage. Well, no, there are, there are round and point fighters. People are looking to control the terms of a fight to win it that way. If you are exclusively and only scoring one score for the whole fight, you're going to score the guy who had the bigger moments, even if it came in pockets. So I wonder that could alter or change at all. But uh, your point about what if, Ten, the trends changed and suddenly you could kick a down athlete or strike the head. Like you said, with, with I mean that, I wonder if that you, you always change wonder, wrestling at all. What rule change? I mean, like, look, the NFL, they had to make rule changes to protect offensive players. Not part. You can argue they, they did it to protect quarterbacks from missing games because people come to see these quarterbacks, but it's also because of CTE and concussions and all that. And what did it do, Luke? It opened up the game, the, the passing receiving records are, you know, through the roof comparative to when you and I were in high school and college. So I'm wondering and, or waiting to see what happens with that rule change. I'm going to guess it's going to happen more, though, not in something in which we're opening up the rules like our, our like the what you just said about, you know, making strikes to a down fighter. Maybe maybe people will say, well, that's archaic. Let's open that up. I think it may be the opposite. I think something may happen for us to constrict the rules more luke and maybe that would have an effect on things changing maybe i think any kind of alteration is going to have some kind of an impact some negligible some significant some good some bad i i wouldn't deny that but the only thing that's kind of interesting is i can't prove this i don't know this to be true but i have a hunch that a fighter not that that type of fighter you get i mean volkanovsky is very very good leon edwards is very very good um, and obviously zero gone is very, very good, but there are going to be other people who kind of try to do that. I don't think a let I'll say this. I don't think a lesser version of that style works as well under a pride style of judging. I think it works a lot better under a 10 point must system. Can't prove that it's just a hunch, but that'd be something I'd be paying attention to, to what extent rule sets create incentives for fight styles. And, um, I don't know that I mean, the 10 point gives us the changed. best incentives. Yeah, rule sets have changed the damn NBA. It's a thousand percent true. It's still a great product, but you know, if you're a, a center that doesn't shoot threes and you're not wiry and and have a high vertical, there's no there's no home for you. There's no room, Luke. So you know, I always say this as a joke, and it's not true because Seth Curry, Steph Curry, I'm sorry, not Seth, not the bootleg brother, Steph Curry. He Luke, he has range that is it changed the game, right? His ability to hit from like 30 feet consistently, it certainly changed the game, but. If you told me a 6-1 guard in the success he had with multiple MVPs was parachuted back into 1994 when Seth's data was playing as a six-man for the uh, Hornets, dude, he's Dana Barros. I'm sorry. Okay, maybe he's better because Steph can really shoot it. But you'd be a specialized oddity like a Dana Barros, a short, quick guy who, you know, who who – can do certain things, but he could drive the lane because those big guys will send him to the first row of the bleachers, Luke, back when he used mm -hmm. to be able to follow people, all right? I don't mm -hmm. know if they'll see something that dramatic in MMA where guys that we know now as point fighters or high IQ guys who don't rely on power, will that be taken out of the game because some of some kind of rule change maybe scoring, as we said? It's interesting to think about, Luke, but again, I think it's more likely to come as a result of some catastrophic injury or something bad that happens on national television where we're like, we got to change these rules just a bit. And then you'll see from that, can more people thrive who wouldn't have had an effect in, in a former game? Um, you know? I don't I think, think they're I ever going to open fair. shit up, Luke. I don't think so. I think it's going to, if anything, you want to put some lipstick on the sport more, right? You want more, you want to widen the audience. I mean, no, I, te I tend to think that the public has gotten a lot more used to it than we realize. I remember when basic MMA KOs would, would would make people real in horror and now it makes them stand in glee there's been a dramatic shift on the palatability now to your point i do think there are going to be some pretty clear limits and those limits while maybe seemingly arbitrary and not consistent they just exist for whatever reason i i, I take that seriously no doubt about it you're right there's a point where you just you can go up to and then once you cross it even just a little bit you've gone too far but that yeah. overton window so to speak has grown dramatically are you looking for the, uh, the fountain of youth underneath your chair? <laughs> yeah. oh, I'd love to play that. No, the, the uh, armrest on my chair came off. The screw came loose. I got a few screws loose over here, Luke. So I'm trying to tighten it with a pen cap, put it back together. Keep All right, let me go to the I'm next here. question. It's from, it's from uh, Jose. Jose says, hello, Brian and Luke. Do you think the UFC would agree for the following talent trade? I, I don't know where people, okay, I'll answer it. 
No, no, before Long you jump. go further, Luke, I love these type of questions. Why wouldn't you entertain this? Why wouldn't you love it if promoters could actually trade at, like the Demetrius Johnson thing? Because which when, really when I tell you what the terms are of the trade, you're going to realize the question isn't really about that, but rather this person greatly misjudges what's going on. Okay. All right. John Jones for AJ McKee is the first part of the question. I mean, absolutely not. They would never do that. And then secondly, do you think Jones would like that, which is sort of a separate question. Imagine Bellator and UFC mm. were interested. Would Jones like it? Now, that's a little bit different to me. But first, let's answer this. John Jones for AJ McKee. Not in a million years would they make that trade. Not no, in a million years. Right yeah, now, the value is still tilted. Yeah, proven pay per view draw against McKee, yeah. who obviously has a very bright future, but is still somewhat uncertain. Do I think Jones would like it? I don't think Jones would mind leaving UFC, but only if Bellator could pay him shit tons of money, which I don't think that they can necessarily. I mean, Jones is the greatest fighter of all time, and he's still under 35. So, uh, yeah, he's, you know, that that's still, and he could still be your heavyweight champion within the next six, eight months, a year for all we know, right? I mean, I don't know if I'd favor him anymore against Singanu, but yeah, he's still too close to there. You'd have to, that trade could you would be do, better. Like, could, let me ask you a question. he was washed, Luke, if he was washed and it was only about Bellator getting a must-see attraction, then you could argue, are you mortgaging the future of giving away McKee, thinking you may not be able to keep him anyway, to try to get someone proven right now? That's the spirit of that trade. Right now, we ain't there. Let me ask a question. Could you do John Jones versus Rumble on pay-per-view prelims on big CBS? Okay. So you're going to put the prelims on big CBS. Let's say, well, Bellator is going to do it up like they did for the McKee and Pitbull card where, you know, they're putting on their, their best, their Sunday best, right? You could do that. How much would it sell? So we're talking about that headlining and we'll say promoted correctly with the available channels. John Jones on a, Bellator pay-per-view, you're saying? Yep. Prelims Against... on big C on big CBS, Oof, you know, media tour, bad. the whole nine yards. Who's he fighting though? Fedor? Uh, Rumble I mean, Johnson. He... Rumble. Oh shit, dude. Um, that's a million buy paper. Well, a million is a lot these days. I don't think it does a million, but I bet it does well. And so for that reason, AJ McKee can't do that. AJ McKee's got the yes. brightest future I've seen in the longest of times, but he's not there right now. I mean, it's hard to really know. Like, is AJ McKee, if you put him in UFC tomorrow, would he, would he go, you know, five wins and three losses against the eight be best lightweights out there? I don't know, right? Or is he? Is it possible that he really is that sort of special generational guy who will have a Mayweather type effect on a certain division where it's just like nobody can touch him and he can do crazy things? I don't know, Luke. I tend to. I don't know. If, that I don't know if MMA allows for a Mayweather. Even you have someone like Habib who was undefeated. First of all, Mayweather had fifty fights. Now some of those, you know, at the end were not the best of his career, but still he got to fifty of them. Let's just put that out there. And second of all, like he would take breaks and, you know, it wasn't as hard on his body and blah, blah, blah. Like Habib almost quit the sport a couple times over terrible injuries. Like, you know, John's about as close as you're going to get to that kind of transformational figure. And, and even he at 34 is just like, ugh, he's kind of had enough, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, do I think Jones would like it? I think if you could line up like Romero, I mean, other boys, but if you could line up Romero, Rumble, maybe... Um, Who's their champ over there? The Russian kid, not not Moldovsky. Um, Nemkov. Nemkov. How, you know, imagine a, a Bader rematch for the heavyweight title. I'm into that, Luke. That's interesting. Yep, that's interesting too. Like there are some ways for him to make things work, but uh, Timothy the biggest Johnson? possible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. come on, Tim Johnson, yeah. bro, right? You know, yeah, that's Fucking big. A, I mean, that's, right? that's big. That's big. Yeah. And plus, I it'd mean, be like brand new, free John Jones, able to get sponsors and blah blah blah, like. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be big. All right. This is from uh, Jesse from Australia. After watching the last Bellator card, Pitbull versus McKee, I have a serious question. Are the best featherweights in the world at UFC or Bellator? I'm Australian, so obviously I have a biased view of Volkanovski. But if I really sit back and think about it, is AJ McKee a better all-around fighter than Max and Volk? Or would these elite UFC featherweights find a way to derail him? One thing I want to say before I pitch this question to you, BC, is this is how you know AJ McKee made a big splash. When fight when fans start asking us, hey, could X from Bellator beat Y and Z from UFC? That's when you know X is on people's radar in a way that they were not before. They're beginning to take him seriously. Yeah. So what do you think? Could he what? Jeez, are you pulling a Luke Thomas and listening to not a fucking word I am telling you? 
No, I couldn't find this. I had, I had some old gum, and I, I don't know. Where, I didn't know where I put it. I found it, though. I found it. Right. You just put gum out of your mouth and then put it back? Yeah, usually before before I do HQ or an interview, I usually have gum, and sometimes I have to I put it down, and I forget to put it back in, and I just have used gum sitting around. You know, It's gross, you're, but it's my office, Luke. You truly are a disgusting man. Um, I, I, I'm just going to give the same answer I always give to this question, which is, yeah, he's probably somewhere in that top five. I, I'll say this, BC. I'd have to look at their ages. Let's pull up the rankings here right now. So AJ McKee is 26, correct? Well, we can't, Luke, we cannot answer this because we haven't hold seen on, AJ hold on, hold on, hold on. Just Follow me here, follow me here. How old is Brian Ortega? Brian, yeah, I think, yeah, right around, right? Because he took a bunch of time off. So he's 30 years old. So let's do this. I'm going to go through the top 10 of the UFC's featherweight division. So Volkanovski passed 26. Yeah, but before Max you Hall even do that, I'm telling oh. you that we can't do this because we haven't seen him face any kind of adversity. Some of that is due to I, his dynamic. I, I want to make a point. I just want to make a point. I just want to follow me here. Follow me here. Right. Just Volkanovski, just older than 26. Holloway, older than 26. Ortega, older. Rodriguez. How old is Yair Rodriguez? He's pretty young. Probably I think like 27. He's like 27. Okay, so he's sitting at 28. 28. And he'll be 29 in October. Um, so that's him. So then you've got Calvin Cater, who I know is older. Arnold Allen is young. Let's see how old he is. Arnold Allen. He is 27 and just turned 27. Well, January, so not just. But okay, so he's still uh, older. Then you go to uh, Josh Emmett, older. Dan Ige, I think, is like 29. Dan Ige is 30. 31. 30. Okay. Edson Barboza, older. Giga Chikadze, I don't know how old Giga is. Giga Chikadze. Giga yeah, but what's Chikadze the point? Is, what's the point here, Luke? What are, I'm going to get to it. 32. Okay, so that's your top 10. That means AJ McKee, I don't know if he can beat those names. Probably some, maybe not all. But he's younger than all of them. He's younger than everyone inside the UFC's top 10, meaning even if he couldn't beat them now, he's got a lot of time to catch up. Some of these guys are 32. I mean, how, how good is AJ McKee if he stays on the straight and narrow going to be in six years, BC? He's going to be fucking good. So well, that's, that's sort of the point. Figure out. I can't figure out, again, if the Pitbull win – is just the byproduct of that he's a super exciting like MVP Luke. MVP could could be anyone on any given night because he does super ridiculous human video game things, right? But he mm -hmm. also on any given night can be absolutely solved. Now you could say that about anybody, I get that, but I can't figure out if what we've seen so far from AJ in his most toughest in his toughest fights on paper has been MVP like flash. And he just hasn't run into like Fernando Gonzalez yet to kind of go, oh, whoa, okay, this guy is no superhero, right? Mm -hmm. Or if he's freaking Tiger Woods of MMA, Luke, I don't know yet. You? I don't know yet either. I don't. I don't know yet. All right, uh, let's go here. ABC one two three dragons love tacos. Okay. Name three MMA fighters, and they put in parentheses no boxers. BC. Name three MMA fighters that you would most like to see a documentary about their lives. Ooh. I got to say, you guys find them much more interesting than I do <laughs> for this kind of a thing. All right. This person says, here are my suggestions. Rose is one. Matt Lindland, because you have the Olympics and the fall of Team Quest. Takenori Gomi, the pride and alleged Yakuza influence. Alexander Emenko, uh, Emelianenko. Of course, he went to prison and has hepatitis. He's also Fedor's brother. Shinya Aoki. What do you say, BC? Sexy Yama. That seems I think like I'd a very be disgusted uninspired if, choice. If I saw what his personal life is like, Luke. He's really who I aspire to be in life. People think I hate Risen and Japan and stuff. Nah, nah, bro. Nah, bro. Okay. Um, Rose would be interesting. Um, you know, uh, Joanna apparently did one for HBO Poland. I'd like to check that out. I'll say this. I don't want to see any documentary if it's made by the athletes, like, with like their production company like you like they hired them to do i don't give a i i don't need your rg3 self-worship i don't need to see it at all like my wife told me like oh we gotta check out this documentary on amazon it's about jay balvin jay balvin is this like sort of famous music producer slash reggaetonero and uh and it was about all the stuff that was supposed to be like you know all, all Colombians were like raving about it dude i watched it it was his film 
he made it and he made himself look like the greatest, most, you know, pensive and deliberate human I've ever seen. I was like, man, right, then you need somebody with highs and lows. Then, guy. Luke, you need it non self made and you need someone who had highs and lows both in and out of the cage, right? To really tell an inside story and tell it accurately about their strengths and weaknesses of character and all that, Luke. So you keep that in mind, right? So hold on, it's all six. So this is what I mean. If someone was able to get his participation, but he couldn't control it, how do you not pick John Jones? How do you John not? John Jones pick him? would be massive. Chael Sonnen would be great. Yep. I'd like to give know what, go. What, 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 you know, why he's wired that way in, in, in certain, certain, uh, Brock, you know, you know, because of the language difference, Jose Aldo would interest me a lot. Yeah, there's, there's, again, there's hey geography stuff made about him. I'm not interested in that. People are like, oh, did you see the Connor documentary? I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I'm not, it doesn't do anything for me. I want to see somebody independent tell the story. Um, but um, Don Fry would kind of be one that would be a little bit interesting as well. That whole era of like hard nosed wrestlers turned fighters around that Mark Coleman kind of, you know, 98, 2000 era. There's a lot of cool shit from there. Obviously, the Smashing Machine was kind of the first of those. That's um, good. That's good. That's a good flick. Yeah. Boz Rutten hasn't had an interesting life, I feel like, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm going a little bit old school. I, I don't, this is, dude, when, when the fights are over, I tune this shit out. I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. Well, you have you, to go old school because UFC does such a good job today with Embedded and Countdown. You kind of feel like you know a lot about the active fighters, correct? I, I know what you mean. Like, there's a ton of information. I don't take the public view of things as all that uh, accurate, though. Like, it's a lot of just, you know, here's the version of the truth we can tell, not the actual full version. Show me the facts. Show me six fighters up, six fighters down on resume review. Show me the facts, right? Ensign Inouye is another one. BJ Penn. BJ Penn. BJ Penn, yeah. 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 All right, this is from the Dragon's Rage. Dragons love tacos, BC. They also love rage, apparently. All right, here we go. Uh, question for Luke. Since you caught the whole thing from Barry Boxing about the rhythm step, I'll explain this in just a second, BC. How often do you notice it when you're observing a fighter so on the like pad work or even during a fight? I saw it, and now I can't unsee it. Do you know who this is, Barry? Uh, forget his last name. I always get his name wrong. It's Get Good at Boxing or Get Great at Boxing is his... Uh, you, um, Instagram account. He has trained a lot of boxers. He's trained some MMA fighters like Dan Hooker and some other ones, but he has this idea called the rhythm step. And if you watch what happens is two guys are facing off two girls, whatever, and they'll interact, they'll fight, they'll, you know, they'll faint or whatever. And then you'll notice that one of them, as they change angles or as a reset moment, typically it's almost always a reset. They'll bring their feet together and then they go back to the exchange or whatever. And he, he sort of noticed that like, this doesn't just happen at low or intermediate levels. This happens at the very highest level that there's a lot of people who are basically the argument would be, he calls it the rhythm step, but the idea would be they're resetting in the middle of these fights. And if you time their reset and you so pick up on their reset, you can attack the reset. And I have to say, it's been a very influential on my thinking about certain fights. Have you known stuff like that? So is it the equivalent of Teddy KJB with the Ore Oreo twist on rounders? Luke, it's a tell. It's a tell, it's a tell, but it's a particular one that a lot of people do. You'll see they'll step out and then step back, bring their feet together and then they'll That's reset. But when they do, they let their, they don't, their hands don't necessarily drop, but their mind is, when you have to, when your mind is resetting, your defense is not cued as acutely as it's supposed to be. And you can, you can land on these fools when they do that. So that's similar to, to the, Angle DC found in the first Stipe fight that Stipe exits with his hands down just a bit and he filled yep. that hole, Luke. Right? Yep. Let's hope yep. the rhythm style is a lot more effective than the rhythm method, Luke, which helped produce you into <laughs> this world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is okay for folks who don't speak Brian Campbell. Let me translate. <laughs> He's very moderately interested in this topic, not really. And he was looking for an exit from it so we could move on. And making a joke about my parents fucking is his way of doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me just say one thing, BC, and I will move on to the next one, which is um, folks have asked me, like, how are you able to pick up on all this stuff in a fight? And this is like, it's not really my secret, but I'll just present it as such, which is, dude, here's the big key to understanding fights. Yeah, sometimes they're over in 13 seconds. Sometimes they end for reasons that have nothing to do with how the fight itself was going, right? There's all, MMA is crazy. 
But what I've noticed most of the time with most fights, especially at the elite end, is everything's a, a pattern. And once you decipher what the patterns are on either side, you'll see it repeat itself over and over and over, not merely over fights, them, uh, rounds, I should say, but fights themselves. So yes, how they got to those positions, what they mean, the very fine details. Yeah, you need to be a really good coach and, and uh, a former fighter to have the, 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 the full amount of information. I make no claims otherwise. But well, if you just understand you're looking for patterns, a lot of this stuff is a little bit easier to pick up on than people imagine it is. So you know what I thought turned into a good story? Do you know that bloke in, in the UK named Lee Wiley, who used to, for years on YouTube, put out those historic boxing breakdowns where he'd take like Sugar Ray Robinson or Harry Greb mm -hmm. or whatever and break down the film, like you're saying, picking up little patterns and showing you the Luke Thomas-like, you know, the equivalent in MMA, what you what you used to do with a very, very well, uh, you know, visited, uh, what, what was it called? dissected very good mm -hmm. segment hope we can see the return of it um luke you may have heard of him because remember when kenny florian had that plagiarizing incident yes that was lee wiley's videos and then he ended up right. having lee on the podcast to apologize i didn't realize good old lee who i followed for years got hired by mtk you know that management team that manages fury and, and billy joe saunders in the uk and mm -hmm. he was part of the team what we didn't talk about was on the zone last week it didn't make have you seen the shit there was a title fight at featherweight. There was that guy, Zhu Can. Um, yes, came I in, did I see that. China. I saw that fight. I, I literally he, saw that fight. He got upset by a, by a UK guy named Lee Wood, who yes. um, knocked him out in the 12th round, but was on his way to winning that fight because they had figured something out on the video. And Lee Wiley was the, was the guy they used in camp to, mm. to, to really figure that out, which is wild because Lee Wiley was just some dude who worked at a factory in the UK that loved boxing, would put out these videos and he got all the way to that level, Luke, and to, to, to your horn, not that you're just some factory worker, although you do a show with a former one, um, you also have had teams work, reach out to you and be like, you know, interest in doing the same thing, correct? Am I, is my, I'm not yeah, they didn't you. want they didn't want to pay me for it, but uh, yeah, I've had a few UFC fighters reach out and ask for some help. Um, That's awesome. And uh, yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. So um, I will say this lastly, Sean McVay, who's the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams, did you see he hired some like guy who was like a reporter for NFL network for a long time guy. I, maybe he played football in like high school or something, but was not in any way would you consider an athlete. He got hired to be like an, an like a coaching analyst for him. Wow. Uh, yeah. Plucked him from me. I always find it when, when they're like, when the coach sees someone in media and it happens quite rarely, but when they see someone in media and then they pluck them out for like a very specific, but also highly important job. And they can kind of fill that niche in a pretty, those are always interesting to me when I see that. And it happens along like, I've seen like people do it with like financials for teams or mm -hmm. looking at tape or whatever. It's always Daryl always... Moore. What was that guy's name? Daryl Morey or Morley. They call him Dork Elvis. He was the Rockets GM and he, he was yes. like a, a stat cruncher of a guy and he figured yep. out trends and it led him all the way to the front office. Luke, you tell, you'd be amazed what you can pick up on if you just watch a bunch of this shit. Okay. This is from Moore Moy. I guess he's in Japan. Hi, Luke. ABC. In the Dillashaw Sandhagen fight, the commentators were talking about TJ's leg injury in the first round. Does that news reach the other corner? We see. I guess it could during the fight if somebody watching at home texts the cornerman of of uh, Corey. I, I, I usually think that that kind of information makes it. That's why we even saw in the Floyd in when Floyd Mayweather ran up on Gervonta Davis and the um the fight against uh, Barrios on pay-per-view on Showtime and was like, mm -hmm. you know, the broadcast has you down. So yeah, that stuff I think gets there, Luke. I don't think it's like formally done, but I think it gets there. Yeah. The, some, I could, I need to double check this. People can dead wrong me if it's wrong. I'm not committing to it. I think there are some States where phone use in the middle of the round or even during the fight itself is prohibited where you, after the fight, take all the pictures you want, before the fight, record everything you want. But then once you get on that ring or octagon apron, you're not allowed to use it anymore. I, I, I need to double check that. But like, you know, also like, dude, they're not, I mean, you know, it wasn't like a hidden injury or some shit. The guy was favoring it pretty clearly. So um, sometimes I think that thing can reach, but it doesn't give you that much benefit. You got, your guy still has to know how to fight. All right, uh, I got time for a couple more here. From QB Killer 77 Hey guys, love the show. Been listening to BC since the ITC days in this corner. Oh yeah. 
It was a great podcast in CBS Sports. It, it, it then we got copyright sued, sued, so it became the state of combat, and now it's morning combat, Luke. So right, there you go. and also have endured and grown like uh, have endured and grown to like LT. <laughs> uh, great chemistry. I love the way you're pulling each other. Blah 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 blah. Okay, makes for awesome theater. Keep it up. Question. Here we go. Considering Pitbull's loss, continuing to uphold the resume review curse. Can you guys do a resume review for Chris Cyborg for her next Bellator fight to either prove or disprove the resume review curse is real? What do you think, BC? No, we would never do one just for the sake of trying like to mess with the yeah. curse. The curse is real. We do, as you had said, an almost defensive of the curse. Like it's a lot of times you're doing the fighter that is more has a deeper history than the other fighter to make the to make great content, to make the resume review make sense. You're not going to do it on a guy who's got, you know, four major fights, right? So that tends to lean towards doing it on the older fighters. And I think over average, younger fighters in their prime are going to be older fighters more often than not. So maybe that explains some of the resume review curse. But I am interested to see, Luke, the first time we do it on a fight that really isn't 50-50-ish, that what it really does, or who's the first fighter that beats the resume review curse, right? Especially if they do it as an underdog. That type of stuff interests me. Although, um, we I don't think we would ever. We're never going to do like that meme last week. Go, oh, Colby Covington's kind of lame. Let's do a, <laughs> let's sabotage his yeah. career, you know? Yeah, we only, I mean, again, I know people are like, oh, it, you know, you're killing these guys. You know, obviously it's whatever, but it's not designed for that. It's designed to be, uh, informative and kind of candidly a little bit of homage to the person who is the subject of it so that folks can understand the significance of the moment um, and also what brought them to that moment. Uh, obviously, it's been a case where we have picked, but didn't it, wasn't it true that Ariel had done a series of interviews for ESPN prior to his departure and he had done the exact same ones we had done for resume review? It's Not like, as dude, many, he, but he was doing those, those weird uh, pandemic ones where he would do it from like the basement like, of a factory it looked like or something like looking or at a tv building. or something right yeah and he'd be looking at the tv and they would set it up that way and they were you know they were well shot and well done but he was picking you know he picked mcgregor which is the guy you would want to talk to heading into a second poirier fight right he picked out asanya which is the guy you would want to talk to going for a second title against blahovich so it's it's not like rocket science but yeah he picked masvidal same thing Luke. It just it yeah. just shows you that we have similar like he and i and you in terms of what we find interesting, we all have similar news judgment. That's really what the common denominator is there. We kind of spotlight, oh, what's interesting to us? We all have similar sensibilities about what that is. Now, as a prediction engine, it's, uh, it's a disaster, but it's not, it's not designed to be that. Um, so, you know. Yeah, well, a scenario, very similar. I agree with you. Very similar. All right, last board. question here, BC. Here we go. From Tyru. No, wait. Ty Rusherter. Rush, Rush Uter, I love this show before and after every big fight. Luke and BC three times a week, never disappoints, blah, blah, blah. Question for you guys. Who do you think should be next uh, to be hit with a lawnmower? Brian's cat or Brian? Uh, no, seriously. Uh, who do you guys think should be next for UFC featherweight Josh Emmett as he is awaiting his return from knee injury? Has that dude fought since the, uh, what you call it? The, um, not since the fight against, uh, the Burgos. Was, Burgos. No, no. We need him back. Luke, this division's hot. We need him. What's up with that cat, bro. This is the longest she's ever let me hold her, hold her. So I'm kind of just rolling with it. This is Emma. She's amazing. She's actually pretty chill. Yeah. She's, she's awesome. She loves my office. She doesn't really love me that much, but this is great. You know? I mean, who does? I'm more of a Reggie guy. You know, I track crazy like a lot of our. Hey, why don't you are... lick and put your mouth closer to the place your cat uses the litter box? You filthy, filthy cracker. <laughs> Can you pick up this purring on camera here, Luke? Tell it, I'm telling Emma. Oh yeah, look at that, Luke. That's great theater. This is great content. I mean, you can't get the you can't get this, this is, on uh, on DC and Hawaii. I'll tell you that the, much. Luke. This is how you know Brian has checked the fuck out. I mean, look at this. He like Brian's the kind of guy like in the middle of a conversation, he'll just like lean over and audibly fart in front of a table just so that the conversation can switch to something different. He's like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this topic. Let me. Uh, it's not true. It's not true at all. Let, let me make a Miguel. What was his face with the mullet who made the rape van joke? Miguel Torres. <laughs> God, yes, yes, yes. Wow. Wow. It was a deep dive right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> 
like Ooh. uh yeah i don't i don't know about the rape band jokes as a good idea well i can say this bc this has been something you know can we take people behind the fourth wall luke you and i are going to film a few of these back to back to fill out our vacation i said look why don't we change t-shirts to make it look like we're not doing it on the same day back to back to back you're like I ain't changing shit, man. I'm wearing the fucking t-shirt right here, man. I'm gonna wear this shirt the whole time. time. You know, you're like, how lame is that, bro? Right? Yeah. Why, why don't you go commit more unspeakable acts with your feline cats? Why don't you do that? All right, you had a question. I'm ready to answer it. Let's do it. Uh, I don't even give a shit this morning. Uh, what's the last one here? Uh, oh, yeah. Josh Emma, who do you want him to fight? I got the top 10 right in front of you. Right in front of me. How about great Ilya division. Toporia? Oh, he's a little bit ahead of him, though. No. Damn, uh, Ige, you could do? If Ige, Ige is coming off a win, correct? No, I think... Didn't he... What about Arnold? Hey, Arnold Allen hasn't been exposed, right? Nope. He's good, dude. He's tough as shit. That'd be a good fight. Or or oh. Calvin Cater, who, who's coming off the, the Max fight still, right? Yeah. Uh, by the way, Ige lost to Chan Sung Jung in his last fight in June. Good call. Yes, yes. What, what the hell do I know, Luke, right? All right. Well, we can call it a day on these. We appreciate all of your questions. Continue to leave, leave us uh, a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And, of course, if you put a question in there, we'll eventually get to it. You can like this video. You can subscribe to the channel. And, of course, you can go to morningcombat.store for any pieces of merch you want to wear for this boring, boring podcast. Uh, BC, anything else? No, I got to go change your shirt for the one we do next after this, Luke. Hold on, right. I'll be right back. All right. all right, for BC, I'm Luke Thomas. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, may all of your gains be loyal.